Hey guys, it's your boy, the jerk down here, and we're back with another episode of Arrow to a Botany with my illustrious guest, the well hung, like a horse, who tends to horses, Sir Niven Bateman. How you doing today? I'm doing great, and the introduction is spot on as always. I like how you didn't laugh that time. I was really trying to get you when I said, as soon as I said tend to horses, I'm like, oh, that'll get him. <laughs> this whole this whole podcast, I'm not laughing. That's my new thing. I never laugh. You're so fucked. <laughs> see, I got you. I would have laughed normally, but I'm still okay. Just, we'll see. We'll see. We got an hour. I'll just say something really controversial out of nowhere. And that will get you. I'm already starting to giggle a little bit. So. Yeah, it doesn't take much. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we're going to start with talking about um, invasive species. And um, at least the way I... When I was actually doing a bit of research for invasive species... A lot of it came up as like, oh, this animal's invasive, oh, this animal's invasive, oh, this animal's invasive. I find that interesting because if you look at invasive species, the majority of it is plants. So why do you think there's a stigma behind, do you think just people care about animals more than plants? Or is it like... Mm, I think it's because people don't understand, uh, like animals are something that are super like, um, what's the word? Like a parent, like... Uh, with a plant, you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that make invasive plants so successful mm -hmm. is a lot of them are really pretty to people. And so they put them in their lawns and they're like, ooh, there's this purple plant in these grasslands that looks beautiful. Like, let's keep it around. Mm -hmm. um, but with animals, like, it's this really obvious thing where it's out here and say it's like, I don't mean just even today, it's like zebra mussels. It's like, they're out there. They're really obvious how many there are, how yeah. numerous they are. I think maybe it's just because, um, I guess you can kind of say that, is that people care maybe a bit more about the animals because maybe their destruction their destruction is a lot more apparent. Mm -hmm. I guess we should also, before we get too much into it, let's define what an invasive species is. How would you define what an invasive species is? Um, it's a species that is introduced by people and that... Um, successfully is able to establish in an ecosystem. So sometimes things are introduced. They're called introduced species, mm -hmm. which we introduce them, and sometimes they don't work mm -hmm. and they just die off. So that's really not an invasive species at that point. Yeah. But it's when they get really, uh, when their numbers grow to huge amounts and they start actually causing destruction in the ecosystem and the environment they're in, that's when they become invasive. I think the key word you said there is human introduction. Is that always the case? Is that what invasive species qualify as? Is that... See, I Can thought about that the other day, and a lot of a lot of um, of the definitions used in invasive that uh, refer to human sort of introductions. And uh, the thing is, is I don't know a lot about invasive species, but I do know that the majority, if not all of them, are caused by humans because it started when we were able to go all over the world. Yeah, a lot of these introductions are caused by boats. Mm -hmm. Coming from like one pa one part of the world to another. Yeah, wasn't the big case first was like rats and cats, that like the rats and cats would get on the boats and then they'd be introduced to the other parts of the world. Yeah, I think I even learned too that uh, mosquitoes are actually an invasive species. Yeah, they're not endemic to North America, mm -hmm. which is like, I was like when I heard that I'm like, wow, fuck that guy who ever <laughs> got ever brought them over. Oh, fuck a lot. Ever brought them over? Like seriously, screw that guy. I'll make one reference that I know my one fan my dad will get is that I hate mosquitoes because of the national bird of Winnipeg. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> they definitely are. But, um, you know, like early, early travelers when they went by boat, a lot of rats would get on there, and that's how rats got spread, and that's how you got like diseases spreading around. And then uh, the little lesser known one is that's actually how cats got spread around first, domestic cats, is because. They'd either bring them over as pets, or they'd just sneak on the boats to, you know, catch the rats. And then that's how you got... That's why, like... Isn't, like, cats and rats the only two animals that cover, like, every part of the world? I don't know. I mean, I'd believe that, yeah. Rats are really bad. Rats, and funny enough, rats and cats, like, this is why we talk about invasive species. Because they can be so destructive, and cats especially. We talked about our earlier podcast about how they're trapping them Yeah, the now. stray ones, yeah. yeah. So, invasive species do wind up being quite a problem. Because by their definition, they're successful in their habitat enough for them to establish. But yeah, let's go back to the whole premise. Because like as we, as you saw with what we did, we just mainly primarily talked about like animals. But if you actually look at like lists of invasive species, like in BC alone, most of it is like a fuck ton of plants. 
Like, oh, there's yeah. just so much. Yeah. I was shocked. Like, I couldn't even get past the A section. There was already, like, at least 60. Yeah. And funny side personal stories. Every time I grab a plant and pick at it, Colin yells at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because this is funny. Actually, not a funny story. It's kind of sad funny story. We'll be walking along trails in parks, and he's always grabbing seed heads because he likes to fiddle. <laughs> but because of invasive species, they always like to uh, grow in disturbed areas, like alongside trails. He's always essentially just picking the seeds and accidentally, like, you're dispersing the seeds. So <laughs> here's, invasive species here's a PSA to everybody out there. Yeah, don't <laughs> fucking pick seeds along trails and throw them at things. Like, exactly. leave, leave plants alone because you're probably picking an invasive species. Probably dispersing. Let's all the talk seeds. about the damage they do to ecosystems, though. Like we already talked about, like the stray cat situation. But let's talk about like a lot of like what people don't know is like. I was doing some research with you in our area, and we were talking, and we were out in the grasslands. And uh, our university keeps like a track record of like each. They do it yearly, right? Because we had that big fire. Mm-hmm. Where they check, like, to see what plants are here, and they check the change, and they've said over time that we've had more and more invasive species in their grasslands out here. So how do you, how would that, like, change the ecosystem, and how does it damage it? So, like, every invasive have it, has its own little sort of dynamics as to how it interacts, but a lot of the time, um, they establish by pushing other species out. Mm-hmm. So one example we have is a spotted knapweed. That's probably the one I'm most familiar with. And there's um, there's something about it where in its roots it release it releases these chemicals that essentially prevent other plants from growing in the soil around it. It's mm-hmm. called a, it's called a allelopathy when that happens. It's it's pushing other species out to make room for itself, and that's one of the re- one of the ways that they can do that too. But they can also um, like cheatgrass is another one, and that one is a really quick growing plant, and it's great in disturbed areas. But it's also one of the worst cases for when fire hits an area, Mm -hmm. because what will happen is fire will hit an area and it'll destroy a bunch of the natural species. And if cheatgrass is in that area at all, it's going to grow up really quickly, faster than the other seeds. And that's going to compete with all the nutrients in the soil, all Mm -hmm. this compete with sunlight and all these other sort of environmental requirements. And it's just going to dominate the area because it grows really quickly. So it'll take over areas like that. And it really just depends on the invasive as to how it works. But a lot of the time invasives work by pushing out other species. And that the problem, that's the problem is it, turns these really we talk about biodiversity and it takes all these nice species in an area Mm -hmm. and it kind of just slaughters them yeah removes them all and then you kind of have this um this area that's not natural anymore and it's sort of a monoculture of this one invasive species or maybe even more and to mention like the whole fire thing is like we live in um an area that has like a lot of wildfires every year like at least we have like what two or three every year I mean, yeah, like, we Major have one ones. going on. Like, yeah, there's there's always, there's hundreds of fires. And there's also areas like Australia that also has, I guess we should say where we are. We're mainly in, like, western Canada. And there's uh, a lot of wildfires there, not only in there, in north northern states, especially, like, in Oregon and Washington. They have a lot of that. And the problem with that is it kills off, like, all, like, it, of course, changes the ecosystem. But then you get, a lot of these invasive species, you'll notice, are, like, fast growing able to like take over areas and compete better than what natural species are yeah and usually really tolerant and a, a lot of the times they're like i said earlier they're great at growing in disturbed areas mm-hmm. and because of like everything humans do usually results in an area getting disturbed and so it seems like just by having humans around that's essentially setting up the perfect habitat for a lot of invasive species because we're always disturbing environments the one thing I also want to bring up with invasive species is, I'm not sure I take a, sh- a shot at scientists. Take a shot. Okay, let's take a shot. Take a shot. I'll, I'll fucking shoot you too. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that um, it's not really seen too much today, but back in about 10, 20 years ago, whenever an uh, invasive species was introduced, scientists seemed to introduce another invasive species to get rid of it. So I think the example was um, there was a there was a fish problem down in the Great Lakes. I can't remember what fish they introduced to get rid of, like, because they had a overly amount of uh, algae, right? So they introduced this fish to get rid of the algae. Then that became a problem. So they introduced, I think, like falcons 
And what they didn't realize is that the Falcons were actually all, not only grabbing the fish, but they were also killing off, like, um, chickens in the local area and doing other damage. What do you think is a better solution to invasive species rather than uh, introducing another species to compete with it? Uh, the better solution is not introducing another species to compete with it, I feel. Yeah. The, well, no, I think, I think that's... I, like... don't, I don't know of a case where that's actually worked. And again, I don't know a lot about this stuff, but yeah. the most notable ones are in Australia, where Australia's whole plan for the longest time was, here's an introduced species, let's introduce something to counteract it, and it failed like fucking crazy because then they had to keep introducing more and more species. And what they ended up with is just this huge nightmare now where a lot of their outback is just contaminated with invasive species. Yeah. And then if you think about like, the Canadian Great Lakes, like that area is fucked up too because they introduced the bullfrog. I can't remember what it was to face. Yeah. And it started eating like cats and baby cats and dogs. Yeah. Of like neighbors' pets, and now they have like bullfrogs that are like bigger than me. I swear. <laughs> so we, I've talked a lot about this at least, but like for plants, there's different things you can do. You can do manual removal, which is just hand pulling. A lot of the time, that doesn't work because usually the root systems are really durable, and they'll just spring back up again next year. Mm. Uh, it helps to reduce it a little bit, but often that doesn't work. There's chemical treatment, which is you spray it with herbicides. Yeah. The problem with herbicides is that they can leave a bit of a lasting effect. Sometimes they're broad spectrum, but a lot of the problems with it is that people don't like them. Yeah, I was going to say that. Despite how effective they are, it's because people want an au naturel sort of Yeah, thing, no, there's which... that perspective when you... We, we should talk about that another time. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a whole podcast on its own is public perceptions but yeah no but let's let's thing. dabble in this thing a little bit but like what's the perspective when it comes to anybody introducing chemicals on plants there's always a hesitation because there's always like you don't want um what do they spray on apples and shit pesticides yeah they they're, yeah. yeah they're like as soon as someone brings up pesticides yeah. you can just see people be like oh no 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 well, yeah because the fad now is to have things as natural as possible but i don't know i'm still i'm a big fan of if we were all, if we were natural people, we would be dead by now. Because again, yeah. medicines aren't natural. The whole well, how the hell would you expect to get our tomatoes from California? They're not gonna. Well, again, it's just it's just the whole. It's, it's, the, it's the natural. natural. It's the natural fad, and yes, to an extent, I agree with that. But some Cause... sometimes we go ahead and just you know eat a bunch of things we don't know what we're eating, but. We do have systems in place to make sure that we're not. Well, no. What I was trying ourselves. to say is, though, if you try to send a natural tomato from California, because California for us is where a lot of like the vegetables and fruit come from. Yeah. If you send that from there, it's gonna rot on the way over. Yeah. So you have to do something. It's just how you're gonna present because, like, like we freeze a lot of that stuff, but it's just again, it's the whole thing of this. This is a really useful tool that we're limiting because of people's fears without. Sometimes without reason. And chemical treatment, funnily enough, is probably one of the better things that you can do to kill off an invasive species. And yeah. now you're looking at the argument of, oh, do we use a non-natural formula to kill off this potentially disastrous plant? Mm. And it's like, I'm more of a fan of the kill off the plant thing. And the other yeah. things are we can burn them, um, which sometimes works. It's similar to hand pulling. It's like you just sometimes, you don't really burn the roots. Yeah, I was going to bring up burning. Like, burning sounds like a great idea on face value, but the problem is, is like, you can damage other plants that... It's usually pretty controlled, but it's pretty, it's the same problems as manual pulling, in which case sometimes you don't get the root system. Sometimes mm -hmm. it works. Like, these things work in situations, but I feel like a lot of the time it's still not that effective. And then one of the most... Uh, there's also, so for... I'm talking mostly about plants, but for animals, there's things like targeted hunting as mm -hmm. well, which I, I don't know, that's, that's, there's problems with that. Most of the time, because it's not 100% effective, but none of these things yeah. are. Well, but, if you look at it, like, here's a recent example for us. We talked about it in the last podcast, is in Kelowna, they had targeted hunting years ago, when I was, like, a younger boy, uh, where you can actually target, you were allowed to go hunt rabbits, because they had such a bad rabbit problem. Yeah. And the problem with that is, is if you bring up, like, let's be honest here, hunting is a hot topic issue. If you bring up hunting to, like, any community, no, how big or small, it's going to raise a lot of ethical problems that people have with it. So that, that's, there's also that problem you face, as well as that, like, bunnies can, like, make so many offspring that target hunting can't really keep up. That's actually one of my favorite solutions. I want to talk about that, too. But I also want to mention biocontrols before we get ahead of ourselves, because we're using now... So for spotted knapweed... Mm -hmm. We use a cocktail of insects that are naturally targeting it. So this is kind of this is gonna sound stupid, and it is because 
the theory is stupid. But we're introducing another species to, pl- to attack plants. Mm-hmm. And that's from an introduced area. But we're introducing the natural predator of an insect mm-hmm. for the plant. So, like, we have, like, five different um, bugs that naturally eat spotted napweed, and they're very specific to it. Mm-hmm. And you introduce it out there. And you let that sort of process of the bug reproducing and eating it, depending on how much napweed is available. Yeah. And that works slightly. It's working pretty well. Um, but it's mainly not, it mainly just reduces the number. It doesn't destroy completely. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the theme, it seems, that once you introduce, the best way to prevent, or the best way to eliminate invasive species is to prevent them from being introduced in the first place. Yeah. And pretty much now it's the rule that once it's introduced and established, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. Yeah, that's that's the other problem. Like, you brought up them introducing insects that only target that. There's still a problem with that because, like, they've done that before. We're like, oh, this, this supposed animal only targets this. And then it turns out that, oh, they decide to eat this thing, too. Yeah, and we're, we're monitoring that pretty closely, and it seems to be pretty well. Hopefully it doesn't go sideways, because sometimes it does. Yeah. Sorry, most times it does. I think we're smarter but- now, but... Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you, you want to talk about the target hunting? Yeah, so, um, like I said earlier, it's 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 not really so much now about removing the impact of invasives, but, mi- like, minimizing the impact of invasives, because a lot of these things we're trying don't seem to be fully 100% effective, so we're trying to combine things now and, like, test different things, and it's mainly, it seems to be, in my case, from what I've seen, we're trying to just minimize the impact. Yeah. One of the greatest things, um, my really good friend of mine, uh, you might have heard of him, his name's... Uh, what the hell is his name? Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he has this great video on his YouTube channel where he went to like some place in Scotland and there was this inn and they were serving crayfish caught from the river. But these, these crayfish were invasive. Mm. And so he essentially was uh, using invasive species as economic revenue, mm. which is like, you don't want to, you don't want to introduce invasive species so that you can have this revenue. Mm. But if you have invasive species in your area, I think one of the most useful things you can do is to teach the public sort of uses for them. Yeah. And you, they don't have to even worry about, um, like, destroying the population. Because yeah. that's a good thing. You're essentially encouraging people to do hand removal. Sometimes there's a concern that they might be spreading the seeds. Like, if they don't know how to properly, like, uh, eliminate a plant. And, like, so in one case, we'll just say, like, you know, this crayfish thing. They don't want to, like disperse the animal they want to actually effectively be able to um eat this thing without causing any damage further so like for example let's say there's an invasive plant um in the forests Mm -hmm. we could teach people that you can go out prior to this thing like reproducing and seeding Mm -hmm. and you can harvest it for food for your family like you can teach people sort of ways to use this plant maybe like study some of the applications you can have like yeah actually get some sort of reason for why people might remove it in the first place so that's kind of a cool thing that i think we should actually be looking a bit more into because yeah. there's actually a lot of invasive species that you can eat yeah so that's kind of neat but yeah when it comes to targeting hunting though for the most part it's successful but there's one big case where it was not successful and actually worse out and actually made the country a lot worse have you heard of something called the great emu war why is it familiar? Maybe because it has such a kick-ass it, name. Because it's, it's so memeable. So yeah. in a, so basically in the 1960s, I ran into research this because I thought it was the funniest shit ever. <laughs> Australia declared war on emus in their country. They had such a bad emu prop problem. Like, it was eating all, like, the grasslands and all that. So you are basically allowed to kill as many emus as you oh wanted, right? They lost. There was oh, just wait, so yeah. many... There was just so many emus... They couldn't possibly keep up and kill all of them. And they gave up after, I think, like, 30, 20, 30 years. Holy shit. (laughs) Well, that's the other thing about... That's why this whole targeted hunting thing, and even, like, removal of invasive species... I'm not trying to, like, shit all over your thing. I'm just saying there's, like... There's that one funny example of how it didn't work. Shit all over it, because I'm actually... That's what I'm trying to say with targeted hunting, and even, like, removal of species... If you remove something from an environment, so say you have a high population of an invasive species, if you remove it from an environment and it gets to a low population, yeah, what's stopping it from just growing back? What's well, stopping well, it from Well, with the emu problem further? is apparently like their uh, reproduction is just so high. That's what I'm saying. That doesn't matter. That's what I'm saying. With targeted hunting, so we've talked about that too in like population ecology and 
that's sort of still out there. But just bring that up. Bring bring that, that argument up to them. If there was someone like defends it, just be like the great Emu Moore. <laughs> just say the great Emu Moore. <laughs> and just walk okay. away. Just have drop the mic. <laughs> have you heard of the great Emu War of 1970? Um, but yeah, if you if you just reduce the population size, essentially what you've done is uh, created a landscape now that has more resources. Because you have a lot less population using them. Yeah. And all that's going to do is allow them to reproduce more. Or you bump or, back up to the normal numbers. Or you allow their who they're competing with to bump up. Yeah. I so mean, let's just say like ostriches, because that's another animal that lives over in Australia. I yeah. Think. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> let's just I'm say not they Australian. live in the same environment, and they're of course they're competing for like the same kind of food. <laughs> if you if you lower one, you'll just create a. Yeah, I mean, a, and that's, a population that's, problem of another animal, and that's theoretical too, like. That's the one, probably the biggest problem with ecology is that, uh, you know, we like to think we know a lot, but every environment's different. And like, you, it's so you, hard you really, to keep it you can't, you can't predict shit anymore. Like, it's yeah. really hard to predict what's going to happen when you do things. And then and a so, drought happens. Yeah, and that's why decision making is so tough now. In and then biology. a bunch of idiots invade Area 51. Are yeah, yeah and then the out, of, out of the blue, you're just standing there one day and five million people storm your goddamn facility and look for you. As you're aliens. clapping your ass cheeks in front of you. <laughs> As you're twerking in front of you. <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for derailing everything <laughs> I just said. That's really that's really great. I didn't derail nothing. <laughs> oh my gosh. You good? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were talking about invasive species. I was clearly mistaken. <laughs> This is just starting into the same shitty podcast <laughs> as last week. <laughs> this one's this one's good. What are you talking about? Oh my gosh! Yeah, what else do I have to say? I don't know. It's, it's I, a, I was I was gonna so, say we're kind of topic. we're kind of at the conclusion of what we're gonna say. I think the big thing is is like as we pretty much say with everything we bring up. Vaccinate your kids. Yeah. Ex- <laughs> 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 Get mad at me for derailing. <laughs> No, but I think education's key. That's kind of what why we're doing this. We're educating um, our three viewers. <laughs> Who's that now? I forgot. Me, you, your dad. Who else? Much. Adrian, no. Oh, can't name drop. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, Christy Gordon from my lab. Ooh, oh, shit. Uh, Matt, Matt, damn it. No. Uh, <laughs> shit. Uh, my sister, she said she's going to watch it and never watch a single one. But it sounds like we're just salty right now. But anyways... Um, no, but I think education's key for a lot of the situations. Like, I th- I find it funny. Everything we bring up, we always just bring it back to, like, the general public. Like, we're not trying to say, oh, look how smart we are. It's just, we we're have just had... We're trying to say, anti-vax your kids. <laughs> Do not support vaccines. Big Pharma's trying to use you. <laughs> no, it's, um... You see, Donovan, you got to confuse the audience. You have to hit them with a vaccinate your kids, then you got to hit them with an anti-vax. See? <laughs> that's how you get the viewers. You, you, that's how you get the viewers, is you just... Uh, you just support both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Joe Rogan. Ooh. Yeah, dude, fucking, that guy's podcast is weak compared to ours. <laughs> what does that guy have to show? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, as I was trying to say, um, when, it, we, we've gotten, a, we've, we've been lucky enough and blessed to actually, uh, hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed. To um, have an, have the chance to have the opportunity to get educated and look at everything from all these different views, and we're trying to present this to people so the general public kind of gets a better idea, so you don't just like read into every headline there is, and they don't spin it. So this way, you have a better idea of what's actually going on with stuff like this. Because a lot of times, when people are like invasive species, they just kind of make it a big scare. Without, like, trying to figure out solutions. Yeah, I'm worried that, um, you know, this is one of those topics that people might, might just give up on. Because mm. a lot of people don't really know too much about invasive species. And I feel that one day someone's just going to be like, fuck it, like, we're the gods of the natural world. Let's just do what we want with our environment and just throw out invasive species. And, like, that's yeah, scary. I mean, we have, thank God, we have governments now that, like, are monitoring for, you know, if we bring seeds into the country. And they're like, oh, what the hell are these things? Like people seed or like these like swat knapweed seed or like corn <laughs> I'm just trying to bring some water the guy now. at the border doesn't know what corn is you know <laughs> rest him <laughs> yeah so 
I think we, since we're talking about public perception, that's a good segue into our next topic. Mm. We're going to, since, if you don't know, uh, myself, the jerk Donnie, is a, is a psychologist. So I look at more psychology-based stuff. Wait, hold on a minute. You're fucking getting up in my grill, my grill about name dropping, but your name is in your fucking, like, nickname. Yeah, but they don't know my full name. They just know Donnie. Big Donnie D. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I call you Sir Niven Bateman, so... Yeah, my first name's Niven. <laughs> so. First name's Sir. <laughs> yeah, my first name is Sir, middle name Niven. You've already said my name on this podcast. No, and, I haven't. And then no, I, no, I haven't. In the podcast... You'll have to go back and watch to the uh, previous videos. I also name-dropped you by accident in the middle of this, but anyways. Um, so we're on to our next topic, talking about public perception, is uh, we're going to talk about uh, false convictions. False convictions. False confessions. I'm retarded. Sorry. Um, and just to be clear, too, I guess we're kind of wanting to switch over now. So we want to talk about psychology as well as biology because yeah. we have both people here and it's always interesting to hear the other sort of field. And we'll, we'll dabble in other sciences, too. We'll take a look at like, yeah, like astronomy, yeah. physics, chemistry, cooking, <laughs> our, oh, sexual, our sexual chemistry between each other. Yeah, that's <laughs> I would love to have room. a cooking show with you. <laughs> that's our that's our spinoff. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you cook rice. Bam. <laughs> Anyways, on to um, false confessions. The problem with false confessions is, well, there's two sides to it. Um, first off, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing the police when I go through this. But fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> if I was to put my Actual feelings about the police, I am not a big fan, just because of what's been going on recently. But that's, that's not... You can't just generalize and be like, oh, the police are bad. Watch me. The police are bad. So we're just going to be a dick now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is... We're playing good cop, bad cop on the podcast, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> or we can do bad cop, bad cop. <laughs> or we can just play sexy cop. Ah, okay. Yeah, you play sexy cop, I'll play... Um, stripper with not enough cash to <laughs> pay my bail are we just getting st- this thing has really gone off the rails yeah it's been 15 minutes and we haven't had any sort of productive conversation no, we had a productive conversation until you it's apparently if i mentioned area 51 you just completely lose everything well i mean we lost everything when we mentioned it last time so <laughs> <laughs> anyways um so i don't want to sound like i'm bashing police when i talk about false confessions because their job is they're trying to figure out the truth and when they look at a lot of cases and like they look at the people that they believe are involved they truly do believe they're the ones that have committed the crime a lot of the evidence does support that this person could have done it even if there's in some cases not enough dna evidence i thought the reason they did it was because there was no evidence but it was based on a policeman's hunch yeah, it's, it's more along those lines, too, but sometimes there's, like, for example, like, let's just say I got murdered, right? <laughs> but, like, two days before you... Let's you were... just say I got murdered. <laughs> no, this is a hypothetical, but you were in my room two days ago, and obviously since you were in my room, your hairs are going to be here. And they can be like, oh, no. Oh, it must have been you who was there that night. But you were there days before, and your evidence just happens to show up. So I'm you're saying I need to quit the podcast. Everyone, it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> but if Donovan gets murdered, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> but, like, for the most part, they're not trying to, like, arrest innocent people. They're not trying to do this. They're just trying to do the best of their job with what they have with them. I'll tell you the here problem... Planted evidence, though. <laughs> Well, yeah, obviously that. But the problem here is it's the way they go about it. So how false confessions usually taking place is um, we've all seen, like, on TV, like, interrogation rooms, eh? I've been in one before, so yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I've seen them pretty well. How was that? Oh, yeah, it was just a blast. Uh, Best time of my life. Had a lot of fun. Um, Guy was great. Just, like, shoved his fucking nightstick up my ass. I don't know. What else do you want me to say? (laughs) Had a really fun time, Bob. What what do you want me to say? How was the interrogation room? It was... No, but we all know the interrogation rooms are terrible. Sometimes... I've never understood this when it comes to, like, police work. 
is uh, we haven't even got to the psychology part of this yet, but um, why do they interrogate people for 14 hours straight? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you're just going to break them down mentally so that, like, if they're... Because a lot of times what, what happens when it comes to a false conviction is the person at the beginning of the thing is like, I didn't do this. No, I didn't do this. And then they make the first mistake of, like, here's just a PSA for me, too. If you're ever in an interrogation room, always lawyer up, no matter what. As soon as you figure out it's an interrogation, always, always lawyer up. Because a lot of the cases we're talking about here are people who didn't lawyer up, and they end up going through these interrogations where they get broken down because... They're in a room with experienced interrogators, yeah. and that's their job, is to break you down and get you to confess. Because yeah. then, let's, 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 if you look at the stats, 75% of the time, they are the person that committed the murder. Oh, with the, or the crime. we're talking about those Mr. Big operations, right? Well, not only that, just in false confession, Oh, okay. just, just in interrogation stats, they figured that out of all the cases, I think this is a state, in the states, about 75%. Which is funny because it happens to match the same numbers as Mr. Big operations. Yeah. <laughs> but 75%. Coincidence? <laughs> think not. 75% uh, of interrogations, um, yeah, the persons are, 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 are legit and this is yeah. the person that actually committed the crime. The other 25% are innocent. And that's just. That is. If, whenever I bring up like a number like 25%, a lot of people think, oh, that's not that high. I'm like, that's, that's pretty fucking high. That's a lot of people. Oh, yeah. No, that's. How many people have been interrogated this year? Yeah, exactly. Like, so, I understand where the cops are coming from because you cannot believe anything the person says in front of you until you get the evidence to support it. But interrogating someone for 14 hours and telling them, think of the situation like this. Maybe the situation was like this. Dream up the situa situation. I never understood that either. Like, dreams don't mean shit. Screw what Freud said. Dreams don't mean shit. Yeah, my interrogations were a lot smoother. Yeah, that's, that's I was nice. like, "Hey, I committed this crime." He's like, "Oh, wow, okay, that was quick. Here's <laughs> your here's your ticket." I'm like, "Oh, thanks." I was out of there. I mean, if you actually did commit the crime, then yeah. Yeah. But like, we're talking about like innocent people here that get broken down, and then um, what happens after you've been broken down is like mentally you're tired, you haven't really eaten much, and you're basically just thinking, "How the hell do I get out of this situation?" Oh yeah, for sure, right. And the first thing you think of is, oh, if I accept this, if I if I just confess and make up the story, and it's close enough, then uh, I'll the the officer said I'll be like pretty much on my way, and I'll be set straight. And then they end up being in jail for like the rest of their life, yeah, or even some have been on death row and died. Yeah, because cops can also make it seem like the consequences of telling the truth are a lot less severe than you. Uh, believe them to be like that's what also what a good interrogator does is he gives you that feeling of security that you can tell that stuff yeah but really if you say anything condemning like even anything that might be slightly condemning he'll take that and hold on to it and, be, and use it against you before i go on i just want to get what is, what is your thought on false confessions because i just gave a general like like uh, how how it's how generally it's broken down well we kind of touched on this with ethics but it's like if you use a dirty tactic mm -hmm. But the result is that something good happens from that. Yeah. Is that a bad thing to do? So with this, like, this is like entrapment, right? Where mm. you have, or not really entrapment, but it's, uh, sorry, not entrapment. If you sort of, as a police officer, make this huge, we didn't even talk about Mr. Big Operations, but if you. Oh, we're getting there. So if you, if you give, if you lie to someone mm. and like really hold that lie in order to get the truth, like, sort of undercover If you don't mind me interrupting like for a second. Yeah, a lie that they generally like to throw at them is just, like, let's just say a crime committed, a crime's committed, and they think I was the one who did it. And in the middle of interrogation, they'll go to my buddy and say, they'll tell me, without talking to you, they'll go to me and be like, oh, your buddy already said that you did it, so you better hold it, you better give up your story now. And that's generally what they'll do to, like, as a big lie, is they'll say, oh, whoever your friend is or family member said that you did it. So then you're sitting there after about five hours and you're thinking, well, if they said I did it, then 
I better get, I better sync my story up with them, otherwise we're both in trouble type thing. And that's a, that's a big lie that I don't like that they do. But anyway, sorry, continue. No, that's pretty much like, it's just, I don't know. It's like, is is the tactic justified if you get a good result? It's like, what, what am I trying to think of here? There's something that... Well, I'll give you their, I'll play devil's advocate there. The way they see it is, if I get someone off the street yeah. that's a murderer... Yeah. Then whatever means to do that is justified. Yeah, but I don't know if that's true though, right? Oh, I, I completely agree. I don't. Right? It's like, I personally don't think it's true. It's like, what if you took a gun mm-hmm. to their baby and yeah. you're like, "Tell me the truth, or I'm gonna fucking kill your kid," and you have no intentions of killing their kid? Yeah. It's a horrible thing to do. Like that's the extreme, right? It's like. Yeah. It's it's like breaking morality in order to, like at what at what cost, right? And a lot of the time it's morality. Yeah. It seems like a lot of the time with these issues, it's the cost is morality, and it's like. Not only morality, but you just put the whole justice system, like, you you kind of destroy the whole foundation of what the justice system is supposed to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's supposed to get the truth. And some people think, oh, you have to get the truth by no any means necessary. No. That's not think, how the yeah, justice system works. I think that's works. it. Is I don't think it's any means necessary. Because the, then, then the we have, like, a, is, then, so that's the thing is, uh, that's, this is exactly why we don't have a police state, yeah. is because... Justice isn't at the expense yeah. of society, yeah. and I feel like at certain like if and if it was, then we'd have a police state where no crimes could be committed because the police were in charge. Exactly. And so I think for things like this, that's sort of what it's what's happening is you're sort of you're getting close to that line with these issues of yeah. you're starting to sacrifice societal values with your methods in order to um, to have justice. Yeah. And I think that's the issue here is it's that's that's what's happening is it's sort of breaking down and getting closer to that sort of police state sort of ethic. Exactly. And that's why we have these laws is because what's the point of having rights if you're not going to Yeah, it's, protect it's, them. I don't believe justice is at at any cost. I do yeah. not believe that. I think if it was at any cost then justice would itself not be justice. I don't think justice wouldn't be justifiable. Yeah. No, there. Oh. Yeah. That t-shirt. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fifth, seventh, eighth T-shirt. <laughs> get a merch. Bring this merch back now. to psychology. Um, you're probably thinking like, oh, you're just talking about a bunch of stuff, procedures. There's a lot of psychological elements because in that interrogation room, you're basically meant breaking. You're basically having just a mind battle with somebody and breaking them down and getting them to bend their will to yours. A lot of times, the police officers will even write out the confession for them. And get them to sign it. And it's basically like the police words of it instead of the person's word. Now where the big problem comes with false confessions is... Is a jury's perspective of it. Now, if you look at most cases, I think... What's the statistic? Fuck. I forgot off the top of my head. I think it's about... 9 out of 10 dentists or beta cucks? <laughs> it came out of I believe it's about 87%. Of trials that have confessions, the person gets convicted. So if you confess to a crime, 89% of the time, or did I say 87? 87% of the time, <laughs> you are the one, you'll, you'll get convicted, even if it's false. Because the whole mentality of a juror is, well, I wouldn't confess to something that, I, I wouldn't confess to a crime I didn't do. Which... I get their logic, but if you think in the grander scheme of things, it doesn't make much sense because they don't understand what it's like to be in an interrogation room for hours on end, not being able to leave, and being told over and over again that you've done something. The the way that psychology has brought this back is that um, they've done numerous tests of, like, and you can even do this with your friends. Um, Ooh, I love this. Play at home, kids. (laughs) So what you can do is... um, Tell your significant other or friend or whatever that they did something. For example, like my friend here, Sir Ivan Bateman. I can say that um, that he loves, oh, that he hates Yu-Gi-Oh. How dare you. And if you tell him that enough times, his mind will start to think, oh, he, he likes Yu-Gi-Oh. To prove that, just do it once a day, just nonchalantly just say it somewhere along the way. Even if, not ever, even sometimes they've even done tests where it's just once a week. And after a while, because your, your mind keeps changing because you keep changing your memories and stuff, eventually you'll, you'll remember somebody saying to you that you hate Yu-Gi-Oh! And then eventually you'll just be like, I think I hate Yu-Gi-Oh! 
but you don't. And that's what this, that's what that happens in this interrogation room is that, first of all, you're mentally exhausted because you keep telling them yeah. I didn't do it, and there's just someone in your face all day. You're you're tired. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You got a sex drive like no other. That's only your problem. Oh yeah, the, uh, different. You know? I'm I'm extrapolating from my own experience in the interrogation. You room. can't just ask the police officer to fuck them. That, that's uh, you. You bet I. You bet your ass I can. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways. When we get back to jurist perspective is they're not as we as we always bring it back they're not informed about what went into the confession because a lot of times even like a famous case recently uh, is with um, what the fuck is it it's the Debbie Peterson case this was back in the it was in 1984 in is it called a dad Oklahoma ADA Oklahoma and basically what happened was is these two guys got talked into confessing because the police officers lied to them they have it on re they videotaped everything and they talked about how they stabbed her to death and it was basically about this guy's dream that he had he they stabbed her to death because he got interrogated day after day the when they finally found the victim's body there was no stab wounds there was a shot to the head they did a retrial he got convicted because he confessed. The jurors knew there was a shot to the head, but because they admitted to killing the person, even though it was through stabbing, they still got life in prison. Does that make any sense? Nope. And that's the problem with the whole perception of confessions, is that people hold so much value on this, even if it's false, that if you confess, like, if I confess, like, Oh, I, I might have punched the person, even though the person might have like been stabbed to death, and that's that might have led to his death. They would, if you confess, they'd believe that over that. And it's just sad if you think about it. Yeah, and courtrooms seem to be a lot about just who has a better lawyer. Yeah, so if you have a good lawyer versus a bad lawyer, like they can twist the sort of either confessions or they can twist the uh, the wording. Yeah, like twist the wording and like sort of just. Yeah, like just sort of translate every the message differently and sort of get a different result. That's why if you have a lot of charisma, you'll make a great lawyer. But even even with like even if you take those factors away, it seems that people like even with a bad lawyer, I can't remember the one case. I think it was law versus the court or something like that. And the case was is the guy falsely com confessed, right? And um, it was blood for trauma to the head and the guy said he hacked the person off of like a saw and he and like the the prosecutor was even he was an admitted like terrible lawyer and they still sent him to jail because he confessed and it seems like that confessions just hold so much weight because if you look at like a lot of like stuff on tv like i hate to bring it back to that but like the power of me there is some power behind media obviously when you look at like all these courtroom things on TV, oh, what's the big thing they have? Oh, this person confessed. If someone confessed, then they just assume that it's basically like people try to put themselves in the situation thinking like, oh, if this was me, I would not confess. Therefore, if he's confessing, he must have done it and just forgot the details because he was drunk or on drugs or whatever. But it's like... That doesn't that doesn't line up. If if you were a juror, and the person got shot, the person was shot and killed, but these people confessed to stabbing the person, would you say they were the ones who did the crime? I mean, it depends on their mental state too, right? That that's one of the big problems. Yeah. Well, in that one case, the one person did not was not mentally there, and had a really low IQ. That's why he was easily, like, was able to tell stories. Because mm. he told his story based off the guy before him who confessed. And he was the one who made up the story. And if you look at, like, both their stories, they both don't line up. The other guy was actually extremely intelligent. I think his intelligence was, like, 110 or, like, 150 or something like that. So he's like, a decent IQ. And uh, the reason he confessed is just to get them off him... And just, uh, cause he thought, oh, no jury would convict him cause like clearly a person got shot and yeah. No comments? <laughs> nope. 
I think you know a lot more about this stuff than I do. Yeah. So I don't have too so, much. So there, there is some solutions to this. Like, the problem with, the, like, the justice system on top of this is, like, well, first off, I think... I have a problem with the jury system as is. Like, I understand, like, you want a thing of your peers, but it's, like... They don't want you to have any knowledge of the case, so you don't have a bias, which I understand... Because if you have a bias, you'll obviously sway whatever way. Yeah, but you're always going to have a bias as a juror, right? Yeah. Like, if someone is out there... So, here's the thing. If someone's out there as the victim, and say they're crying... Yeah. And sort of... if It also depends on who the victims are. And who the victim and who the who the defense and who the... Uh, whatever the hell the other one is. Mm. Prosecutor? I don't know. Fuck, dude. I There's don't know prosecutor and defendant. Yeah, so... Yeah, we'll say, like, the victims in this situation. Yeah. So what if they're guilty, and they're just really good at crying, and just being believable and convincing yeah. and so the other person who's maybe um uh, accused of like uh like say uh, attacking this person yeah. what if they're like just a by nature like a very like blunt-faced man very and, arrogant like, yeah even that like what if just their personality because we have personality biases as jurors yeah what if just someone's a really good actor yeah and you're sort of biased towards personality yeah I think that's one thing is if you have a jury, mm-hmm. they're going to be biased because every single person has biases. Well, the other thing is like most people want to side with the law. So when you go, when it's not, I don't really like what also with like the media is involvement in it because like as soon as someone's accused, it's all over the news and they make it look like this guy did it because mm. he wouldn't be on the news if he didn't do it. Right. So when they go in, they already have this perception that the, defense that oh this guy must have done it otherwise we wouldn't have been here that's another problem that comes into it so it's all about like a lot the problem with a lot of like when it comes to like the law and stuff there's a lot of like biases and perceptions that occur as you go in i guess the one thing i'd toss to you is after all this stuff i laid out in front of you what is something how would you change the system um robot juries that's actually something that's been talked about is artificial intelligence being involved in the courtrooms. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like no. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's easily something you can manipulate. You can just type in shit. Yeah, that's the thing about all this. It's like, this isn't one of those things where, like, you definitely know. This wasn't. This isn't one of those things where the justice system is perfect, but you also don't have a good suggestion as to how it can improve. I have right? one suggestion. Just inform the general public more about court proceedings because when a lot of people go into like a oh that's jury true situation, yeah actually no one's educated as to how to behave in a courtroom so and another be polite and another problem i also have is that the selection process if you're like anything that's like pretty high because like a lot of times a prosecutor gets to pick who the jurors are mm-hmm. and a lot of times they'll single out anybody who's has a higher intelligence oh right yeah because they'll single out certain people they'll pick more people that are along the lines of like They'll actually convict this guy. More people that are willing to... Uh, obviously, you can't know about the case. You can't know about, like, too much detail about the law. Because uh, there's actually one thing. If you know about it, try to figure it out again. But I'll tell you about it, too, at another time. But uh, if you know about this one thing, they'll always kick you off jury duty. Oh, um, I know this one. Yeah. Uh, can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, though. Isn't it essentially the right to say, like, as a juror that, like... Even if you know the defendant is guilty, you can say not guilty or something like that? Yeah. What the hell is it called? I don't remember. We're great hosts. <laughs> I, I, just, I do remember that, though. Yeah, because... You, you, can, you can claim it, too. Like, you essentially, as a juror, you can claim... You can make that claim. Yeah. And they'll be like, nope. <laughs> like, this guy, this guy out of a courtroom, but they can't say that because you're already on the jury. Yeah. No, that's that's the problem I have with like a lot of juries is just like if you look at their interviews afterwards, especially like I was watching a bunch of documentaries before this, is uh if you look at them they'll be like, Well the person confessed so they've had to do it because I would never do it. And it's just like you're basically basing it off of somebody's words rather than the facts at hand. Right. I, that, actually, I actually do I just came up with uh or just remembered rather Probably, probably the perfect solution to courtroom is I totally blanked on even remembering this thing. So here's what you do: is you just what was it? You replace all judges, yeah, with um, Judge Judy. 
<laughs> and then that's your system. You clone Judge Judy, and every judge is Judge Judy. That way, every single case is replicable. You can repeat it all. Yeah. It's the same person doing all the sort of, you know, judge work. It's perfect system, really. Judge no, Judy, you, you Judge think Judy of, sponsor. Just us? think of all the back. You think of all the backlog that would be the like this tour systems already have so much backlog as it is. Okay, here's the next thing. Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> uh, the Honorable Oprah Winfrey. Everyone under their chairs gets a, a get out of jail free card. <laughs> it's a good thing you're taking this seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, there's not really, like, if you, if you try to wrap your head around, like, the justice system, it's really hard to find, like, a perfect way. Because like, there's yeah, so many exactly, loopholes. Right? It's it's difficult. That's all. But if, while we're on talking about law and a bit of psychology to go with it, let's talk about something more close to home when it comes to Canada. So, another big problem that also leads to a lot of false com- confessions, I believe 75%, which is hilarious how it matches up, Nine out of ten dentists, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's called Mr. Big Operations. Now, if you don't want a Mr. Big Operation, which if you're from anywhere that's not in Canada, I'm not surprised because... It's very illegal in most other countries. Yeah, it, it, in the States, it's really illegal. They do. They will not, like... Actually, that's not true. I'll, I'll bring up a couple of cases. Actually, I'll do it right now. So there's been about three or four cases in the last ten years where they used... Big, Mr. Big operations as admissible in court, which is technically against the law. You cannot use Mr. Big operations as evidence in any courts except Canada through third party. What do you mean by three, third party? So basically what that means is like, um, how the fuck did they phrase it? It's still, technically, like, it comes down to a lot of, like, just ju- uh, judge discretion, but when it comes through third party, it basically means, like, if somebody outside of, like, the prosecutor or the defendant brings it in as evidence. Oh, okay. So, like, let's just say um, it's, like, the state police that's doing the prosecution against... Like, let's just say it's, like, in a... Not, not a, like... Let's make it simpler. If it's in a federal court, it's like the federal court against somebody for like a murder, then like a state police, I believe, can bring it in because they're not part of the federal branch, eh? Okay. So they're the third party that can bring it in. And that can still be used in courts. I might have just fucked that entire thing up, but... Moving on. <laughs> Experts. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what a Mr. Big operation... Actually, you research it. I'll let you take this one. I didn't research it that much, but essentially... I'll fill it, I'll fill it in for you if okay, you mess sure. up. So essentially what a Mr. Big operation is, it's used for cases where, uh, like I said earlier, where the police have a really strong suspicion or um, some evidence that would prove them guilty, but not enough to be tested. And it's also generally cold cases too. Yeah, so like a lot of used for cold cases that like, they're just like, man, I don't really know how to really proceed from here. So they're used for these things. And what they do is they'll take the person they think is guilty and they'll create an entirely made up uh, and false criminal organization yeah. that's really appealing. And they'll, over the period of like weeks to months, they'll befriend this person with undercover cops and slowly introduce them and offer them a position in this undercover organization. Yeah. Until finally, after doing a bunch of very illegal things. And showing them the lavish lifestyle. Yeah, as well. showing them this lavish lifestyle, they'll finally have them contact the guy in charge of the organization, who's an undercover cop, and they call him. In this case, it's the Mister Big, and they'll have him um, essentially say, in order to stay in the in the organization, you gotta confess to like your past life and your crimes and all that shit. Like you gotta be like loyal and, and trusting, and you gotta like trust me with this shit, and I gotta trust you. So they'll set up this huge lavish lifestyle for this guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, or another way they'll do it. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Go is ahead. um, the cops like they'll the Mr. Big will say, "I just got co- I just got word from the police, like my my mole in the police. Oh yeah, yeah. That uh, they have this case on you. So can you tell me exactly what happened so I can go and oh yeah, scrub I, the records. Yeah, and that's the other thing is they'll make them testify or, or confess by being like, "Yeah, we can remove your record. You yeah. just gotta tell us what that is. Yeah. So in order to be in our, in our organization, we gotta have you have a clean slate." So tell us what you did wrong, and we'll get rid of it with our, our in at the police. And to put on top of that, 95% of times that big Mr. Big was allowed in court, 
the person got convicted. So 95% of the time, that's pretty successful. It's actually considered the I most... Su- 75. No, no, that's 75% of the people are bad, 25 are innocent that are in the case. 95% of the time it's been allowed in court, the person's gone to jail. Oh, shit. Yeah, so 75% of the people are actually, like, the criminals. So, like, that shows that the system's actually good. But still, 25, much like the false conf- uh, confessions, 25% of these people are innocent. Yeah. And 95% of those people are getting it, are getting convicted. So what is you- the problem with Mr. Big, Sir Navin Oh, Bateman? okay, so I've, I was actually just going to say that. So, a lot of the things I read was, one which I brought up earlier, is it's sort of, it's one of those methods that a lot of people wouldn't see as ethical. Mm-hmm. It might sort of approach that police state by giving the police a lot of power as to what they can, def- like, defy, so, mm-hmm. so it's like, social socially. Two, it, uh, I don't even know if this is allowed, but um, it also, it makes the person commit a bunch of crimes, and that's a form of entrapment, where you set them up to, essentially set them up in a perfect position for them to commit a crime yeah. that they may have otherwise not have done. So yeah. in this case, being pressured to do it in order to be in this lavish lifestyle. Exactly. Uh, so that can be seen as a form of entrapment. And at the same time, too, is I think that if someone is still committing a crime in these organizations and operations, that they can actually get charged for these in court. Yeah. And so, like, if you put them in... And that's that's why entrapment's so bad, right? Is like, yeah. it essentially... It, 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 uh... What's the word? Motivates people to break the law. Exactly. Or it sort of it pushes them down that path. And then the f- other one is that these operations cost so much fucking money. Yeah. Like, I think the average one was $150,000 yeah. per operation. And there's been 350 in, like, the past couple of decades. Yeah. So do the numbers on that. <laughs> <laughs> and another big problem with it, too, is uh, the whole perception of, like, if you're in a big gang like this, like, obviously, like... The planted cops that are acting as the gang members and the thugs are going to be extremely violent and show the, how violent this group is to scare you into being in there. And then, like, yeah, they do for like- a lot of people, it's easy to be like, oh, if, if I cross these people and don't make up a confession, they're going to kill me. Yeah, and they do, like, fake murders and shit. Yeah. So that's one thing is it's pressuring them that way, too, is also threatening. And also... I think that alone should not make it allowed to be in any court. I know. And it's, 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 yeah. Because you're just creating a situation. The other thing, which is on the exact, a similar note, is if once you get to this Mr. Big Guy and he says, in order to stay in this organization, I need for you to confess what you did wrong. And because they're the police, they're immediately going to be thinking you're guilty. And as Mr. Big, he's going to be pressuring you. Yeah. because they assume you're guilty they're going to be pressuring you into saying this thing yeah. and if you're this guy that had just gotten whatever he's down on his luck he's desperate for a job he needs money to live he's had a shit life yeah. and if you get put in this position where all of a sudden everything's so lavish and this guy's offering you this perfect lifestyle but in order to do it you need to say I did this Yeah. do you really think that that guy's going to like care about the truth I don't think so. And this guy's pressuring him to say this. And in order to stay in this organization, you can tell that this guy thinks you did some crime. So you're going to say that. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, like you're saying, like, one of my boy at the police station has said I was kidnapping this person. And, like, the, Mr. Big's going to be pressuring you to say that. What the hell do you think you're going to do? Yeah. You want this lavish lifestyle. You're not, you're not going to disagree with him and say, oh, I didn't kill anyone. You want to look like a badass. You want to yeah. say, like, yeah, of course I Well, also to him. add to that, if you've been accused of being a murderer, you can't really get a job after that. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. like, you already, like, have a shitty life as it is after that. You have to fight tooth and nail just to prove that you're innocent. And then yeah, these people you get are... accepted into, like, this world that gives you money. Yeah. Gives you friends. Yeah. Of course you might want to lie, right? Yeah. Like, of course you might want to lie about having a criminal record. Now, let's spin it a little bit. What's the pros of Mr. Big? The so pros f- is that it can definitely solve cold cases. And, okay. and like you said, there's a good statistic where a lot of these people... Um, are guilty in the first place. Yeah, one thing I was going to throw is that I believe in the Canada justice system, it is so far the only thing that can solve, like, the hardest cold cases. Yeah, but again, this is the whole situation of at, at what cost. Yeah. I don't know if this is breaking that line of, like... I think of, it is. Yeah, I, and I still, I, don't still have, I still don't have an opinion as to that. I don't know if it's justified or not, because... Yeah, it costs a lot of money. I mm-hmm. kind of don't look at that because a lot of police operations cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so I kind of eliminate that. I have a huge moral issue with this one. 
honestly, like part of the reason why I'm getting into psychology is I want to start. I want to. Jo- I hope one day I can join like the Innocence Project. If you don't know what the Innocence Project is, please look it up. It's basically a group and community that tries to combat false con- uh, confessions. So far, they've been able to get, I believe, ten thousand falsely accused convicts out of prison, out of death row. And have walking free again. So please check them out. Um, the one thing I reason why I want to get into psychology is I actually want to hopefully make add to making Mr. Big illegal in Canada because I don't believe the benefits outweigh the costs. Because if you look at the statistics, twenty five percent is really high. And there's I don't believe there's no place because ethically it is it's the worst fucking thing I've ever seen, heard of. I will say that there's obviously good reasons to why this was illegal in other countries. Or yes. Is illegal. I still don't know if I can say for sure, in my opinion, whether I think it's justified or not. But yeah. I, the, really, the two biggest problems I have with it is that there's forms of entrapment there where any of these crimes that these guys commit in the organization that he's pushed to do, yeah. that they are pushed to do, is entrapment, and he can get charged for these, I'm pretty sure, at least. Yeah. And the other thing is that a lot of these confessions that they may make to this Mr. Big Guy could just simply be lies because he's pressured to say this yeah. shit in the first place. Well, the other thing is, like, for me, a lot of times if you, like... The other problem with Mr. Big is, like, a lot of the people they target in this thing are people who have low, lower IQs. And I'm not trying to, again, make fun of, like, people who are not as intelligent, but you're more susceptible to suggestion. And they purposely target these people. And that's just... It's just not right, in my opinion. Like, I think there's... Like, obviously, cold cases are, like, impossible to solve. And I do feel for the families. But when you look at... It's like, what's the point of trying to solve a case for somebody just to put an innocent person in jail? It doesn't make the person who lost the person feel any better. Because then they just think, oh, there's another life lost to yeah, this. Yeah, if they are innocent, at least, right? So yeah. I think that's the pro- the two problems right now with this is like, for why I can't make a, a uh, like a f- concluding answer as to how I feel is like, one I don't know if like the psychology but the whole entrapment and, like forced um, testi- testimonials are there. Yeah. And the other thing is that this is an ethical issue, which means that it should be voted on based on everyone's opinion. Yeah. So everyone needs to have an input into this, and then yeah. based on the majority opinion. Is this an ethical thing or not? Yeah, I think this needs to be brought to light because, like, when I was in psychology, I never heard of this. I never heard of it either. Yeah, and it's... People don't really talk about it. Like, you don't really see it that much. It's That's probably why... That's probably the justification for it still being technically legal in Canada is because it's only used for those really hard cold cases. But it's... At that point, are you already reaching for straws? You know what I mean? Like, you're already grasping for straws. Yes, I see the 75%, but 25% of 350. What is that? That's that's a, that's a few lives. That's a few families. So, like, that's that the other affected. thing is, what are the, other, what are the other ways they could deal with cold cases which might be more ethical um, and, and less expensive? A lot of cases, like, for, for a lot of the beginning ones, what they could have done is actually done better DNA research because DNA research is just starting to come around in the last... 10 20 years that's something they could have done because a lot of like the cases that you look at for like mr big like in the beginning they could have just been solved easier with some dna for nowadays i don't really have an answer but at the same time it's is it is it worth is is it worth to put 75% baddies in if you're putting in 25% good people? Yeah, it also depends on the crime. I feel like this isn't something that's justified for a lot of crimes. I but believe Mr. Like, B- I believe Mr. Big is only used for murder cases. So that's that's one of the nice things. This is if it's used for really hard crimes, then like, yeah, there's a bit more justification. If it was used for minor and petty shit, then yeah, absolutely not. But yeah. It costs way too much. And yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, I think that's a good way. Good place to end it. We will be doing another podcast next week, I hope. No week or two. Yeah, um, this episode has been sponsored to you by Colgate. <laughs> join us Join us next week when we eat Tide Pods. Let's talk about the Tide Pod Challenge next time. <laughs> no, but um, 
I think it'll be going. We'll we'll be bringing more psychology into this. We might even bring some other sciences or some other stuff. We might even do one on philosophy. We'll never know. We'll keep you guessing. I'd love to do that. I love philosophy. Yeah, me too. But anyways, um, thanks as always for watching. And just remember, we're all just meat machines. <laughs>